Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Hancock. Welcome to Humanistic Management Professionals Lunch and Learn. I'm Jennifer Hancock, founder of Humanist Learning Systems. I am a board member for the International Humanistic Management Association USA chapter. And my co-host is Elizabeth Castillo. Please introduce yourself. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Elizabeth Castillo, Assistant Professor of Organizational Leadership at Arizona State University. Welcome. And a board member for the USA chapter. <laughs> of the International Humanistic Management <laughs> Association. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, okay, so today's topic is managing for meaningful outcomes. And we have our guest today is Charles Chandler. He is a speaker, author, and podcaster. He's the host of the Age of Organizational Effectiveness podcast. Dr. Chandler graduated from the University of Texas at Austin and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he studied engineering sciences as well as economic, environmental sciences, and geology. He founded a management consulting firm called Assumption Analysis in 1982, where he has undertaken a variety of assignments for clients all over the years. Over the years, he has worked in 25 countries and has helped formulate major initiatives worth over 60. Oh, 80 billion U.S. in countries around the world. Dr. Chandler is a member of the Academy of Management and a registered professional engineer in Texas. He serves on the board of a nonprofit arts association. Welcome, Charles. Hey, great to be with you. Uh, <laughs> do I need to expand my screen or anything here? No, it's all it's all good. It's all good. So, okay. Charles. Managing for meaningful outcomes. Can you give us about a 10 minute overview of what this is and what it means and why we should yeah. be doing it? <laughs> yeah, to get started, uh, let me just uh, show you a ball here. Um, and I'm really coming to you with a message from the future because I think we will we'll all be managing for meaningful outcomes in the future. But let's just, let's say this is a an organization, it might be a temporary organization like a project or a program, or it might be a more permanent organization like a business or a nonprofit. Um, so traditional management um, is concerned with funds inside the ball, basically. Uh, so we're converting inputs to outputs. And I'm gonna be talking about a four level model. And the first level is an inside the ball, ball. Basically we're going from inputs to outputs. But outside the ball, we have the environment of the that where the organization lives. And in the environment, we have level three and four, the outcomes and the impacts. Uh, so we're going to talk about narrative stack. And the uh, order to survive and thrive, the organization must exchange benefits with its environment. Otherwise, it's going to die. And so um, basically, we're going to talk about how that, how that sort of works. Well, let me just finish up real, real quickly here. Okay. Um, so basic idea of managing for meaningful outcomes is to add two additional levels um, to the narrative and uh, implement this using positive values. So we're looking for positive effectiveness and the outcomes um, are our indication, our demonstration of effectiveness. So we have a market test or a demand side test for the things that we're offering uh, to the environment. And we can manage a portfolio of offerings in this way, uh, as well as roll it up to the organizational level because these benefits that are being exchanged across the supply demand interface are additive. Uh, whereas if, if we were just doing internal efficiency improvements, uh, those are not additive across the portfolio. Um, so there's a number of benefits to this. Um, and let's see here. What we're doing is focusing on an exchange of positive benefits with the environment. Um, so perhaps just in summary, what I'm trying to say is if we can fix management through this new approach, we can fix organizations and fix the planet because uh, we're putting essentially constraints and um, we're, we're self-managing and self-regulating internally by putting this meta goal of positive effectiveness 
uh, on the organization. Um, and that gives a lot of benefits. Uh, first off, there's real-time decision support because we're, we can view these outcomes in the field and it, it uh, verifies that our results chains are working. Um, and we have our power, our narrative stack, which adds to the legitimacy of the organization in its environment. Um, and then there's more freedom for internal actors to innovate because instead of the top down command and control, we're organizing um, self managing teams around the offerings to the environment. Um, so, in, overall, it's a better technology uh, for human accomplishment. Um, and we could get into other things like it also facilitates global system stability. But let me stop there and perhaps we can move to the Q&A because we're having some technical uh, yeah. issues. No, the, your audio cleared up immediately after you stopped sharing um, your screen. So that was what the problem was. It was just too much going through the bandwidth. So too much, let me you know. kind of reflect back to you what I understood you to be saying um, it's not enough to say well we want to sell a thousand widgets that's a low level outcome that you can traditionally manage for efficiency or we want to sell a thousand widgets what you're saying when you manage for meaningful outcomes is you're actually concerned not just with the selling of widgets but how the widgets will be used to improve society once they're once they're sold and out in the environment and in the hands of consumers say. So it's adding this level of understanding of what it is you're trying to accomplish is not just to sell a thousand widgets, but to actually improve the world tangibly through whatever the product is or the project is. Did I understand that correctly? Um, well, let me modify that slightly. Okay. Uh, uh, it's not about so going from inputs to outputs is about producing a thousand widgets. Okay. And then once we find somebody that wants to buy them, let's say they have certain attributes that are attractive, uh, then um, that sale takes place and uh, that's where we get the outcome. So that's the behavior we're looking for, uptake, adoption, and use. Um, another example would be, let's say we want to buy a riding lawnmower uh, for our, our home. And we go to a big box store and we hand over our credit card, uh, which is the financial flow to the big box retailer. In return, we get some economic benefits uh, for using that over time. And then, um, you know, so there's a variety of benefits that are being exchanged. I didn't, I wasn't able to show that particular slide, but I have a hierarchy of benefits that are exchanged at the supply demand interface. So it's not just about the money, it's not just about uh, the financial and economic, it's also about the social and psychological, as well as the environmental and spiritual benefits that are on offer for different types of things uh, that the organization might uh, be willing to uh, produce for the environment. So how how do we integrate those other, like the environmental benefits um, and uh, the, the other social, psychological, humanity-based benefits into the decision-making tree because when we're managing the you know efficiency model, um, the control model almost never takes those things into account. So how do we pragmatically start introducing those? Is it just a tweak in the way we're thinking or is it something more, um, I don't know, pragmatic that, you know, there's a toolkit we can use and say, okay, did we check off this box, this box, this box? Yeah, well, we're trying to understand our, our appeal to them in the most uh, appealing way. Uh, and, you know, your narrative can involve spiritual benefits. Uh, in the uh, lawnmower example, um, you know, when you're out riding your lawnmower, you can wave to your neighbors, you can be seen as a productive member of the community um, and be creating a better environment uh, for your neighborhood. Uh, you know, so it depends on how you, um, how you appeal to the consumer in terms of the narrative, but also how they receive it. Uh, because you, you want to understand uh, what they're thinking 
and and certainly that dialogue uh, uh, should take place. So basically, you you get some you uh, let's say develop an offering, you test it quickly, see what kind of response you get, improve it over time through changing its attributes, um, and then you're getting this real time decision support from the environment uh, because you're seeing how um, how robust the flow is across the supply demand interface. Okay. And if you're doing things on the web, on, on the web, you can do A-B testing even. Um, you know, you're trying to sell things on the web. Uh, you can have one web page that looks one way and one slightly different and have A-B testing uh, to decide uh, which, is, which is working the best. So uh, these are complex systems that we're dealing with. Um, you cannot um, look at the past and then project forward in a complex system uh, to see uh, what's going to be happening uh, because things are always changing, always moving, and you have to test what works now, essentially. Uh, so that's so what we're saying. Let me, let me ask a different question and bring this into the realm of a team. So say I have 10 staff members and I have them working on something. How do I help manage them to in the meaning, meaningful management framework, right? So meaningful outcomes for my team. I'm part of this larger organization. We maybe we're creating widgets. We are part of it is this little thing. How do I take this concept of meaningful outcomes if our customers are maybe internal to the organization? So my team is doing due diligence on you know, land use or something. How do I help manage, how do I help them not just focus on how many deeds did you look up and, you know, whatever it is, but look at the larger picture of how this is going to impact other people. Do you have any advice for that? Yeah, well, um, the model essentially is describing an organization as a whole and it's um, relation with the external environment. Now, if you're internal and you're not outward facing, you have a unit that's, let's say, um, producing something internally for the organization, you could still look at the ultimate you know, customer beyond your internal customer uh, to see how they're reacting. Because uh, even if you are producing something for an internal customer, they're also going to hand it off uh, externally at some point. Uh, so you want to be sure that, you know, you're looking at the business case um, and, you know, feeding in that uh, Sarah uh, externally at some point. Uh, so basically, uh, so it provides uh, much more immediate feedback um, at the outcome level uh, where, where the exchange takes place between the organization and its environment. We can actually see those behaviors happening. So is this, this something this that can that has to be done? at the higher levels or can lower level people implement this um, at their own level, even if executive management has not implemented it? Yes, I would say you can. Um, you could look at your own little group as a, a, uh, a source of, of production uh, and the external, external to you at least environment is, is your uh, internal customer, or your next chain up the command, um, and try to understand how they're looking at these things and, and what, what response would they have that would, would uh, you know, be in the best interest of everyone. So basically you're trying to ratchet up the health of the internal world as well as the external world by um, thinking about all the implications and um, adding attributes or testing attributes to see how the response uh, comes across. And so it's, it's a continuous system of testing and improving and then delivering and observing behaviors. Does it matter what the, I, when we're talking about external goals, um, you know, this is a humanistic management, you know, organization. So for us, we're thinking about it in terms of how can we make the world better? How can we um, 
have you know improve sustainability uh you know integrate the sustainable development goals within our organizations how can we improve employee well-being and flourishing and and you know environmental flourishing so um does it matter to your meaningful outcome model what those external outcomes are or is this useful you know even for negative purposes <laughs> that's a weird thing to say but it, you know it's kind of what's going through my mind and jen that actually makes a really good point so you're basically asking does this account for both positive and negative externalities is how right. we frame it in management education so that was on my mind too charles yeah so notice that i said positive effectiveness in in one of those slides there uh, so we're trying to eliminate the negative values. So we want to, let's think of a circle, you know, and the top half is positive and the bottom half is negative. So basically you want to stay on the positive half. You don't want to be like Enron or WorldCom or, uh, you know, Volkswagen, Wells Fargo, and, and many others that have been in the news. Um, so you want to do, you know, what's best for the customer, be honest, uh, you know, all the positive sorts of values that you could think of. Uh, and avoid the negative ones down where, you know, the drug cartels and ISIS and Al Qaeda and all the others are down there. Uh, so um, if you could, if you could stick to the positive values and have that as a, you know, positive effectiveness within your environment is your meta goal for every organization in this, in this method. And if every organization was using this sort of approach, it's, it's highly, consistent with humanistic management, certainly, but it also um, it ratchets up the health of the organization and its environment, and it makes the world a better place. Uh, so if you think in, um, I'm going to be a little bit um, out there here in a, in a minute, but uh, let's say we think in cybernetics terms. Cybernetics is, uh, you know, the health is the study of systems and the control. And so um, what managers are trying to do in a cybernetic sense is control the system within certain parameters. They don't want it to spin out of control with too much energy in it, and they don't want it to atrophy and, and just sit there and do nothing. Uh, so managers basically are not, not specifically controlling the people, they're controlling the system, um, you know, which includes the people and the assets and all sorts of things that are in there. Um, and so by imposing a goal on the system, uh, you limit the variety of states that the system can assume. And the first law of cybernetics is that control systems uh, have to address all the states that the system itself can assume, you know. Uh, so variety, only variety can absorb variety. So like if you have a, um, a thermostat on your on your wall at the house and it's controlling the air conditioner and let's say it can only go on and off um, and then you know all you need is a control system with two settings that automatically keep the temperature uh, it turns on and off to keep the temperature constant um, but when you get to more complex systems uh, you need control systems that uh, will address all the states that the that the environment can or the system can assume um, so what we're trying to do, you know, the, re the reason the world is spinning out of control, you could say, is technology is uh, proliferating and, um, uh, you know, that, that is basically increasing the number of, of the variety of states that the system is assuming. Um, and so what this method tries to do in one sense is to um, limit the variety of the, of the states that the system will assume by, by, con, by limiting everybody to positive values, much like humanistic management, um, you're, you're imposing a meta goal on each organization and they help the system overall. Does that help? Yeah, no, that actually clarified a lot. The idea is if you, if you force the system to think, I'm going to focus on what the positive outcomes could be, you've, help just kind of frame every every management decision that's going to be made underneath that system right yeah so you're so. you're self-regulating and self-managing right by limiting yourself to 
to positive values, and you're looking for outcomes to verify that that whatever you're doing is working in the field. Okay, I have another question. So getting that immediate And this comes up a lot whenever we talk about um, looking at positive external values as part of our decision making matrix, and that is. Um, the debate between profitability and responsibility, right? Because when we talk about positive values and positive external outcomes to our business activity, um, then the question is, how do we balance what is seen as responsibility as opposed to a positive activity to create positive good? Um, it's now considered a responsibility that is competing against profitability as a good. And can you talk about whether or not and how firms can survive and thrive if they take a concern about positive external outcomes as a primary motivator. Yeah, well, let me go back to, let's say the 1980s when um, General Motors and other car companies in the US uh, were using that logic. Basically, they were saying, um, you know, we wanna be profitable, we wanna go at the lowest cost, uh, in fact, I had an uncle that used to work for GM, and um, he was always concerned about how to reduce uh, the price of ball bearings by, you know, a tenth of a, of a penny uh, over millions of ball bearings. Um, and, and so the logic there was, okay, we're going to have the lowest cost on these things, and that's going to help our profitability. But then the Japanese came in, and they brought in quality improvements, um, and basically during the 70s, you know, because of the oil price increases, uh, 73 and 79, uh, consumers started looking for higher quality vehicles with smaller and, and with higher fuel efficiency. Uh, so, you know, profitability depends on the, in, on the environment and the whole logic here. Um, and so now we're in a different environment in which, um, you know, we have environmental problems, um, certainly, and young people are marching in the streets. Um, the whole logic will change because uh, of, of pressures in the environment, and um, anybody that's going to follow uh, these kinds of new ideas about positive outcomes or positive effectiveness in the field um, will probably find um, uh, you know, a willing audience at this point because the environment has changed. That's, that I help? like that thinking that by focusing on the positive impacts we can have in the community, that actually helps us adapt and adjust and actually be profitable. Because if you're not caring about the impact you're having, then you're ignoring market trends, <laughs> right? Um, in, if well, the consumer is changing, people, right? Yeah. <laughs> The consumer is changing. They're uh, reorganizing what they want to spend their money on. Um, they're more likely to invest, let's say, in uh, things that are environmentally uh, sustainable and uh, positive. Uh, so the whole um, thing shifts. The whole logic shifts as, as the environment changes, the consumer changes, and what works in the environment will also change. Uh, and so if we can quickly test and observe uh, our outputs and our, our outcomes um, and the response to our, our outputs and outcomes, uh, then, you know, we're, we're ahead of the game, basically. Right. Um, okay, so real quick, are we going to be able to get your, your slide deck that we can share with everybody since they didn't get to see the whole thing? Um, sure, so yeah, I can, I can definitely send that to you. Perfect. Um, the next question I had, and then we'll open up for you know Elizabeth's questions. I'm sorry to dominate, but that's what we do. Um, so the next question I had is, you know, one of the questions that I think about, I spent a lot of time thinking about, is how do we create cohesive work teams out of diverse work groups? When you have diversity, you have people with different concerns and and different ideas and and different motivations. Can we use this idea of focusing on uh, meaningful positive outcomes as a way to help us create cohesion in a diverse work group? Yeah, I think so. Because um, once you have, let's say, a meta goal at the 
top and you, the C-suite is no longer then um, cascading objectives and KPIs down from the top, then what you do is you form self-managing teams around, around the offerings and they are free to ask themselves every day, essentially, how best can I serve my environment? And so this increases motivation and uh, engagement at the employee level uh, because they're now um, full partners, essentially, in producing the outputs and outcomes of the organization and through their team, um, you know, making a real um, uh, impact on, on, on this world. You know. So it's not just that they're creating widgets, they're now creating widgets to do whatever this other meta goal is, right? So they're creating widgets to help this part of the team accomplish this larger objective that is positive good in the world. And that's what allows them to essentially self-manage themselves. Right. Yes, you know, because instead of just uh, meeting KPIs that have been cascaded down from the top, uh, their team is now rewarded uh, for you know a positive outcome in the field uh, as the flow across the supply demand boundary uh, is is robust. Uh, so. Um, I don't know whether I explained that uh, fully so, or not, yeah, but no, you uh, that's I, the basic I'm idea. I'm understanding it. We had, um, we've had conversations on self-managed teams before in this framework. So I guess the question I've got now is, okay, I've decided that I'm going to help my team uh, self-manage themselves by using this meaningful outcome framework, but the... I've got a mid-level manager who's all about control, <laughs> who's not bought into this at all. What do I do? Uh, well, you have a problem, uh, you know, and uh, I'm not saying you're going to be totally sh shut down there, uh, but uh, in any management situation, you need a higher level buy-in, certainly in order to overcome the barriers that are, that are normally put up. Um, so really you need to have a conversation at the top, is the highest level uh, to begin with um, and, and to help free up the, the controls that are over controlling the system. Okay. Um, you know, uh, organizations are doing budgeting, they're doing uh, performance reviews, they're doing um, organizations cascaded down along with KPIs. Uh, and this is overly constraining the system in many cases. And so innovation, uh, to get innovation, you really need to loosen some of those controls um, because people are really excited about doing these things if uh, they get the chance. All right, so it, to me, what I just heard you say is um, siloing, control through siloing, basically, of information is is gonna hurt this effort because if you're gonna have the innovation and self-managed teams, they have to have authority to do the work, which means they you know they need to be able to interact with other ten other teams to to collectively get the work done. And the role of the manager at that point is not to control at that point what is the role of a manager. Yeah, because uh, in the in the past, in the two le two level model, you know, which was command and control, and everything's cascading down. Uh, it's a basically authority is cascading down. But in this new model, we don't respond to authority. We respond to information from the field, and it's a network. And so uh, the teams are authorized then to go to whoever they need to go without going up the chain of command. Uh, and respond, whoever has the best information on, on what the environment wants, uh, that's what the team would, would follow, basically. Okay. I love this because now I'm tying it back to the conversation we had with Doug Kirkpatrick at the beginning of the year, um, but giving us another level on how exactly to have those conversations to make that happen, right? Um, people do... Yeah, if the if the manager is the meaningful outcome, right, then 
it does free up everyone to work collaboratively towards that goal. And then the problem is, you know, people who are used to the command and control structures, how do we help them adjust? Is that a training issue? Or do we have to get rid of them? <laughs> like, what do we do with these people who are used, so used to command and control structure that they're having a hard time adjusting to autonomy and self-directed action towards this meaningful outcome as the, I assume, upper management has defined? Yeah, well, a lot, a lot of middle management is not there anymore. Okay. Uh, they, they were mostly a, a relay role anyway. Uh, you know, cascading information down from the top. Um, but, you know, this, this whole framework actually takes a lot of the burden off of, of the C-suite, off of leadership, because it becomes uh, self-regulating and self-managing. And so then top leadership only has to manage the exceptions. Uh, so if you, if you say that, you know, C-suites are no longer going to do these, this planning and budgeting and strategy and all that, um, they're only going to fund good initiatives uh, that come from the bottom up. Uh, and so, um, you know, this frees up a lot of the, the constraints that, that we've had in the past. Wow. This is like way more radical than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Elizabeth, it's, it is radical, yes. <laughs> it's incredibly radical. Elizabeth, do you want to kind of chime in on your thoughts on this or do you want to do questions? Um, well, I actually will because I'm, what you're saying, you know, my background is in the nonprofit sector, Charles, and what you're saying basically is like a logic model that we use. It talks about outputs, outcomes, and impact. I'm wondering, do you use, to, what tools do you use for planning and, and helping uh, an organization map this out? And then have you considered um, like social accounting tools that talk about multiple types of capital, like social, reputational, psychological, um, as a way to start um, making some of these more intangible things tangible? Yeah, uh, um, I wasn't able to show that slide, but um, there's a hierarchy of benefits that are exchanged, um, you know, financial, economic, social, psychological, uh, spiritual, and environmental. And each of those you can talk in terms of capital there as you're, as you're building them. You're not only exchanging them, but you're building capital um, as, as the impacts also go from outcomes to impacts over time. Uh, and so the tools I was using, and, and we typically use in development, because much of my background is from development, is the logical framework, which is, is the four-level model, inputs to outputs, outputs to outcomes and impacts. Uh, the only difference is that uh, they do not uh, distinguish between supply and demand in the uh, logical framework. Uh, but in my, my model, I do. Uh, and I think it makes the distinction between outputs and outcomes much clearer when you have a, you know, the inputs and outputs are on the supply side and the outcomes and impacts are on the demand side. There's a very, very bright line there. Um, and it's easy to see that you just cross the organizational boundary uh, when, you're, when you're delivering the outcomes. Uh, so I think that, that uh, helps quite a lot. Um, but yeah, I agree that uh, the capital in, in let's say social capital, psychological capital, and, and other kinds of capital uh, are intangible, but they're, they motivate the exchange, you know, exchange of these kinds of benefits. Um, and at the nonprofit level, certainly, uh, lots of compensation for volunteers and others involved in the organization uh, are, is, is intangible and it's. Uh, social and psychological. Um, thank you so much. Um, now I'd like to open it up to um, questions. So the first one is Ravi. Um, Ravi, I'm going to unmute you if you're um, there so that maybe you can ask the question yourself. Um, are you there, Ravi? Uh, yes, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, do you want to ask your question about the triple bottom line? Yeah, triple bottom line is a concept that we discuss in most strategy courses, and it talks about three types of bottom lines. The first bottom line is obviously the economic benefit or the profits to the organization. The second one is corporate social responsibility, taking care of the surrounding communities in which the organization is embedded. And the third bottom line is the ecological conservatism. 
and there are a lot of uh, there's a sea change in how we look at new investments made by a company and moving from pure financial economic models to what Elizabeth was talking about, uh, social cost benefit analysis and so forth. Uh, but what I find glaringly missing in your discussion is this whole idea of uh, trade-offs and balanced resource allocations. And we all know organizations are not democracies. Uh, they have some minimum expectations, minimum thresholds of financial performance. Uh, and so you have to really take into account the trade-offs and balance resource allocations into discussion. Otherwise, it's almost utopian to just say, let everybody become self-managed teams and address ecological conservatism at the cost of the financial performance minimums that we have to develop. There's always some sacrifice, uh, meaning you have to live with reduced financial performance if you're addressing the other two bottom lines. So my question to you, Charles, is very simple. How do you address these gaps in terms of trade-offs and balanced resource allocations in your excellent presentation? Yeah, I agree that there will have to be trade-offs, uh, but I'm not, I'm not suspending the principles of accounting or financial management or economics or anything like that. Uh, this model really is a results hierarchy, and for the first time, really, it it provides a way to measure organizational effectiveness in the field. Um, you may know that um, scholars gave up the search for organizational effectiveness concepts in the mid '80s uh, because they couldn't find anything anything that could be verified in the field. There was no objective reference, um, so by you know, confining your initiatives to results chains and defining an outcome as a, a behavioral update and use from the opposite. Uh, this gives a very visible, um, you know, objective referral that, and you, have, you can have a portfolio of these initiatives and you can roll it up to the top to get an organizational um, measure of organizational effectiveness, which, which has never been possible in the past. Um, and, you know, the goal model is what most people are using. And yet the goal model will accept the goal, and, and not all of those are not, most of those are not related to effectiveness. So even if an organization achieves its goals, um, whatever they might be, and in many of those areas talking about, uh, doesn't mean it's effective. You're you're breaking up again uh, on us, Charles, and it's very hard to um, follow what you're saying as a result. Um, so I'm not sure how we can fix that. But um, um, well, Jen, is this a good time to talk about the continuing education certificate? Yeah, that that's probably a good thing to do, and then we'll we'll ask a couple more questions for those of you who are looking to get continuing education certificates. HRCI has approved this session for a business credit. SHRM has approved it for regular uh, PDC, and I also offer general certifications of um, participation for this. Um, to do that, just put in the chat room. We need your name, your email, and which certificates you want. You can ask for more than one of them. Um, and uh, my company, Humanist Learning Systems, will issue that later. So name the name you want on the certificate, your email, in which certificates you want. There's an HRCI business, a SHRM PDC, and a general uh, for whatever. Elizabeth, do we have another question? Because I have something I'm burning to ask him, and I hate to take up time from everyone else. <laughs> Um, well, I, there are, I was going to group um, a couple of the questions. Um, it really gets down to what counts as meaningful. I mean, yeah. and I think this builds on Robbie's thing. In the end, it really is like a matter of values, prioritizations, and also time horizons. Um, so, uh, and the other, uh, builds on your thing about narrative, right? The importance of, of framing the issues. And so can you talk about how this helps, who gets to decide what's meaningful and and how the how what tips you have for framing the issue? Yeah. Um, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, so meaningful in this model, um, nobody has to decide what's meaningful. 
uh, it's the demands of response. So there's an environmental test to I'm all sorry, of your. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Whose responsibility is it? It's 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 no one's responsibility to decide what's meaningful, other than the demand side actors that uh, are interacting with your offerings. Uh, so if uh, if you're producing widgets and people are buying widgets, uh, apparently they are meaningful uh, to them and they have a use for them. Uh, on the other hand, if you're producing widgets and uh, nobody's buying them, um, then that particular results chain is ineffective. Uh, so, you know, in, in a nonprofit, if you're, you know, have an arts foundation, and you're, you know, providing plays, um, and you know, in some places, the art, art of the all tickets are sold, and other places, not too many tickets are sold. Uh, so this becomes a demand side test, and so in the future, those places that were not many tickets were sold because they were uh, perhaps. Um, uh, not a great interest in the audience, um, then the you know, foundation would then uh, modify its offerings in the future. Does that help at all? Jen, yes, that does help. Thank you so much. Um, Jen, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yes. Um, so the question I have has to do with the high level structuring of this. As I understand it, you're saying what we should be redoing is completely restructuring how we think about hierarchy within the organization and instead of having a command and control hierarchy build a hierarchy within the organization based on meaningful outcomes and the whole organization is structured in support of the meaningful outcome as opposed to so then the question becomes how do we modify and transition from a command and control to a meaningful outcome hierarchy like, how do you pragmatically do that? Because I don't think it's something, like, you may be able to do it within a work group, um, but it seems to me that has to be organizational, or maybe you can do it in, in a work group um, and build it from there. I'm not really sure, but it, it, I'm curious about how pragmatically do we control in when the hierarchy is not... Uh, how many widgets did be sold, but how happy are, you know, whatever the meaningful outcome is that was decided, we've increased the number of people who have clean water in the world, right? So if that's our good outcome that we've decided we want, how is our organ, how do we manage the organization towards that? And how do we transition our teams towards this goal when it's kind of eliminates a command and control hierarchy that everybody's used to. Like, how do we yeah. pragmatically well, do that? <laughs> what are the steps? Yeah. Uh, um, I don't know that we have to tear everything down, but we have to build on top of what we have, certainly on, on top of level one and level two. Uh, we need our level three. And we need our goal, our overall meta goal, which says we want to be positively effective in the environment. So instead of uh, taking guidance from the top authority figures uh, who may not have the right information, we want to take our guidance from the responses, outcome level responses that the environment is giving us. Um, and so, the the role of the C-suite would change, or the top-level management. Instead of um, doing strategy and budgeting and um, top-down command and control, they would be, you know, looking at, um, let's say, exceptions to the self-managing and self-organizing system that was below them. So. Um, with our meta goal and our teams that are organized around offerings, uh, we then have a lot of self-management and self-regulation that's going on at the lower level. Uh, these self-managing teams are authorized to uh, do everything they need uh, to deliver their outcomes in the field. 
So top level management, then a lot of the burden is taken off of them. They don't have to uh, be super. Uh, they, they simply have to guide the system uh, when needed um, to handle the exceptions. Right. When I, I used to work in a self-managed matrix organization, and um, I was part of the decision-making matrix that handled exception processing. And you're right, with self-managed teams, there's a, an external objective, a, a, you know, a meaningful outcome that the teams are working on. And if something doesn't fit, it goes into this other process. We always viewed yeah. ourselves as support to the team as opposed to being on top of the team. You know, we were taking things out the bottom and helping get them fixed to get them back up into the team that so the team could work on them. Um, I'm kind of in my mind, I've have this image of an HR professional who's decided that they, they really like this idea of meaningful management and they're now going to their bosses in the C-suite and going, okay, but, okay, but, you know, this meaningful outcome that we want to have is, is telling us we need to do this as a change. Is that going to help, help create, is, you know, is that going to get them fired or is it, <laughs> I guess it depends on who's in the C-suite, right? Certainly it depends on who's in the C-suite. We need a change of attitude and philosophy, in a sense, uh, to implement this, uh, this new approach. And, you know, uh, we would need to have a two-day retreat off-site, I think, to get uh, the, the major players uh, and with, the, with the approach uh, so that they didn't uh, basically stand in the way. Okay. Like, no kill. C-suite, you're not allowed to kill this initiative. When your staff is taking on these, these, this authority for themselves that's actually positive, it's but, okay, but I think, you will survive this. <laughs> I think the payoff here, you know, I think the payoff is that the organization should improve its performance by 20% or more. Uh, so instead of um, running the machines faster, as in, uh, you know, modern times, uh, the movie, um, we're essentially uh, re removing some of the uh, uh, friction in the system by elim eliminating a lot of things that uh, are not helping us at, you know, along the way. It's really interesting, and I wish we had more time to get into it and that the audio was, was better, because I, I really feel like I want to dive into the pragmatic aspect of this. Um, like, you know, okay, so what are the tangible tools? Are, is there software that will help teams coordinate and collaborate in this way while allowing the managers, which I'm now putting in quotes, <laughs> uh, to kind of track and support the activities? And at what point does, you know, if a team is stuck, does management, the role of management come in to help unstick them with decision making? in support of their effort as opposed to externally, well, I have to meet these, you know, these out, these are arbit rather arbitrary output criteria of producing a thousand widgets when we might not need a thousand widgets, we might only need 700 widgets. Um, but I've got this goal of a thousand, so I'm making a thousand. It just, I, I just feel like, yeah, there's so much pragmatically exactly how does this happen and how does it work and what are the tools that are required that Elizabeth brought up earlier, but I think we're running out of time, so. Yeah, I th think the software most people are using is scorecarding and uh, KPIs and stuff. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, reorganizing exactly how they're, they're doing it. Uh, so I think you can take the existing software and, and work with it. 